Beautifully done, and thank you for the privilege of opening the book of God today to the people of God. We know these words are always a savor of life unto life to all who will receive them. We come here today to obey the admonition of the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians to honor those who labor among us and are over us in the Lord, esteem them highly in love for their work's sake. And so, Dr. Moeller, we come today to give honor to you, to esteem you highly in love for the miracle that God has performed on this place through your one solitary life. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to John chapter 4. Hold them there for a moment. You know, as I look back, <clears throat> I'm old enough to remember well when Dr. Moeller came here. I, the same month he came here, I left my pastorate in Fort Lauderdale to go to the pastor of the First Baptist Church in Dallas the same month in 1993. Uh, you remember his baby face look in that Q&A that he did in this room? Well, I knew his baby face look when he was a teenager, when I was a pastor in Fort Lauderdale, as he would come down there and visit uh, First Baptist Church from time to time. Uh, he never came under my eschatological persuasions. However, he tended more to lean toward my compatriot, Dr. Kennedy, down in that way. But our daughters... Uh, Susie's and my daughters both were educated at Westminster Academy where Mary Moeller's valedictorian status is still legendary uh, in, that, in that particular school. Uh, he came to a school that we heard a lot about last night at a banquet <clears throat> uh, where he inherited a faculty, most of whom, many of whom at least, discounted most all the miracles of, of Scripture and would put it in print, would say the burning bush really wasn't burning when God spoke to Moses through it, that it was probably the fall of the year and the leaves were turning and the wind was blowing through and it gave the appearance of being on fire. Or that in 2 Kings 5, the axe head didn't float. Or in uh, the sacrifice of Isaac, and I could go on and on and on at the discounting of those things. I listened again the other day in preparation for this for that Q&A, trying to think how did a young 33-year-old baby-faced theologue like that, face down such opposition, such vicious opposition in so many ways that we heard of last night. Uh, graduates who would refuse to shake his hand when he gave them a, a diploma, they would come to chapel and stand up and, and turn their backs to him while he spoke in chapel. It was the environment uh, that he uh, inherited in this place. Uh, most of you know about a, a THM thesis that was written a few years before he got here uh, in which that young student had surveyed the students who came to Southern Seminary to find upon their fall semester, their freshman year, that 87% of them had no doubt uh, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Now, I don't know where those, well, I do know where those other 13% came from, but by the time they graduated, only 63% of them held those same beliefs. When they got here, 85% of them believed that Christ was necessary, faith in Christ alone was necessary for salvation. But by the time they graduated, only a little more than half of them still held that Jesus Christ was the only way to eternal life. He inherited a school where the faith of young people from our churches who were being sent here was being deconstructed b before our very eyes. And you know, when God chooses to do a work of his sovereign grace, he seems to always choose a man. A man. If, he, if he chooses to deliver a nation, he, he picks a Moses and speaks to him from a burning bush and says, come now and I'll send you unto Pharaoh to say, let my people go. If he decides to establish a nation, he picks a David. If he, if he decides to spread his gospel across the Mediterranean world, he chooses a Paul. 
And when it came time to rebuild the Southern Seminary, God chose a man. He chose R. Albert Moeller to come to this place. Now, you know, there's, a, there's something different that took place in these last 30 years than took place in the life of Boyce or Mullins or McCall or any of those others of long tenure. They came and they built a seminary. Al Moeller had to come here and rebuild a seminary. When you build something, there are a lot of things you must do. When you rebuild something, there are a lot more things you have to undo before you can do them. It's an astronomically much more difficult task to rebuild something. And that's why this is so much a part of the miracle uh, that is here. Al Mohler, some think, has a way of intimidating you. I know nobody in this room has ever felt that or been in his presence to do that. I certainly have, talking to him sometimes about some theological or philosophical or social nuance and everything to somewhat be intimidated. But thanks to his daughter, I'm never going to be intimidated by him <laughs> in this way anymore. Now, those of you who were not at the banquet last night, Katie showed a video of a side of Dr. Moeller that many of us haven't seen, a video out in his uh, fishing boat uh, that he sent back to his grandchildren. And uh, I don't know if any of you saw the movie Classic Waterboy, but <laughs> Coach Klein on the other side of the field looked at that mean coach on the other side, and, but he'd always see something else in his face. I'm never going to be in discussion with Al Moeller about anything again and be intimidated because you know what? When I look in his face, you know what I'm going to say? Hi, I'm, I'm Mr. Catfish. Goo, 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 goo. And I, that's, the, that's the impression I'm seeing. So gone is any kind of an intimidation whatsoever. You know, we get our word influence from two words in Latin, in and flow. The word pictures that mighty river flowing deep and vibrant with a strong current and into it flow these little tributaries and streams and creeks and they're carried away in its flow. And we're here today to give thanks to God because we've all been caught up in the flow of Al Mohler. So how did this happen? What is the secret to the miracle that has taken place on this, on this campus that has literally touched the world, that has sent already multiplied thousands of people all over the world? I've, I've identified three things about him, but long before I ever identified them about him, I identified them in Jesus Christ. And as Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Al, today, I, I want to lead us to identify three things of which we can, we can imitate you in the way that we find you imitating Christ in John chapter four. I don't like to preach a text without reading the entire text. But for brevity's sake, I'm going to assume that those of us in this room today know the account that takes place in John 4 when Jesus meets a woman in Sychar at a well in Samaria. There are three important things about our Lord that we see in this text. And I wish we had time to delve with all of the verses, but I'm going to, I'm going to allude to about three or four of them. Because there are three things about him here that we see that are vital to our own lives, that we see are the secret, I'm convinced, of Al Mohler's leadership at Southern Seminary. He, Jesus always knew where he was going. He always knew who he was, and he always knew why he was here. I don't know about you, but I'm influenced by people who know where they're going. I'm not influenced by people who get to an intersection of life and wring their hands wondering which way am I going to turn. I'm influenced by people who know where they're going. I'm influenced by people who know who they are and not trying to always be someone that they're not, but know who they are and how God has gifted them and live within the gifts that God has given them. And I'm influenced by someone who knows why they're here, who are moved by an inner purpose a drive, a spirit compulsion 
that leads them. And as we look at the text in John chapter 4 today, the first thing I want to address is the fact that Jesus always knew where he was going. He says as they leave Judea to journey back to the Galilee, he says in verse 4 that he had to pass through Samaria. I love the authorized version here. I must needs go through Samaria. He always knew where he was going. Not once in the Gospels do we ever encounter Jesus when he came upon a circumstance and situation and said, well, that was a surprise. I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. He had knowledge. He had foreknowledge. He, he knew where he was going. He never came up on a situation and said, and said whoa, whoa, I, I, we didn't see that one coming. No, he knew where he was going. And I don't, again, I don't have to detail because of brevity's sake. Everybody in this room knows the nuances of the Samaritans, the Syrians, the intermarriage and all that went place and, and, and how this Jews and the Samaritans had no dealings and how it was so unusual for a Jew to take this journey, but he was on mission and he knew where he was going and he knew he must needs go through Samaria. Like the Lord Jesus Christ, the one thing I've noticed about Al Mohler is he's always known where he was going. He's been a person of vision. He, he's never gotten to an intersection of life that I've ever seen where he wrung his hands to wonder which way to turn. He knew which way he was going to turn before he ever got there. Because like our Lord, he, he's known where he was going. Dr. York said last night that people with great vision are drawn to people with a greater vision. And that's what's taken place here. The miracle of Southern is because uh, uh, Al Mohler has known where he was going. And when you have a vision, when you know that, you know what it does? It brings definition. It defines your task. Anybody that's been on this staff or, or, or this faculty uh, know that. It brings definition. It brings direction. You know where you're going when you have a vision. It brings a new dynamic to what you're doing. A and it brings a new dependence upon a sovereign God upon whom you must ultimately always depend. People don't give themselves to needs. We don't rebuild institutions by talking about their needs. We don't, we don't build churches by talking about needs. People, I've noticed over decades of ministry, people don't give themselves to needs, but I'll tell you what they do. They give themselves to visions. They give themselves to see something that's bigger than they are and that makes them totally dependent upon God. And a part of the miracle of Southern is Al imitating Christ and always knowing where he was going. Secondly, our Lord always knew who he was. He engaged this woman in conversation. As we all know, he spoke to her of living water. She, she said to him, we know that when Messiah comes, we know all that. We know he's going to teach us all things. And down in verse 26, he says to her, I who speak to you am he. He knew who he was. 12 years old, he was surprised that they wouldn't know that he was, as he said, about my father's business. He knew who he was. On the Emmaus Road, beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he did expound to Cleopas and that other unnamed apostle, disciple the things concerning himself from Moses to Malachi, from the, from the Pentateuch to the prophets, Jesus preached Jesus on that road to Emmaus. He, as he talked, I, I, I'm sure he said, I, I was that ram at Abraham's altar. I was that Passover lamb. I was the son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He knew who he was. And like our Lord, we're here today because Al Mohler has never come to this place to try to be somebody he was not. He knew and knows who he is. Uh, we have a word for that. <clears throat> if the word for knowing where you are is, is vision, <clears throat> where you're going, the word for knowing who you are is integrity. 
You know what we heard last night at that banquet? The beauty of that banquet was we got in and we heard about every aspect of Dr. Moeller's life. Personal, intimate, professional, public. Everything was giving testimony to it. Reminding me that Al Moeller, like you and like myself, we live in four worlds. You have a private world. And no one comes into your private world. Al Moeller lives in a private world. No one comes into his as, as close as he is to Mary, she doesn't know all of his anxious thoughts. And I'm sure he's very thankful of that today. We all have a private world. We also have a personal world. And that personal world of that close inner dynamic of interpersonal relationships where a, a husband, a wife, children, grandchildren, know us in the intimacy of father and child. And, and, and if we're fortunate in life, maybe two or three people in life really know us like that outside our immediate family, that personal world. Then we have a professional world where some of us are known by scores, hundreds, thousands of people. They don't know us personally, much less privately, but they know us in the professional setting. And then there's people, there are people like Al Mohler who have a public world where people who've never really dealt with him professionally or personally or privately, they know him in that public persona. And it bodes the question for all of us, where do we root our integrity? We're living in a world today where some people seem to think that it's rooted in the public world. And so they hire all kinds of public relations people to spend their public image so people will see and think that they are people of it's not rooted in the public world it's only revealed there and if we're in ministry ultimately it's going to be revealed there whether we have it or not you say well it must be rooted in the professional world where they're on the anvil of personal experience we beat out those principles of it it's not rooted there it's only reinforced there if we have it it's not rooted in the personal world of interpersonal dynamics. It's only reflected. It's rooted in that private world alone with God. The secret of a man who imitates Christ alone with God. So why? So then it begins to be so obviously reflected in the personal world. So obviously reinforced in the professional world as we see it all around us. And also revealed for God's glory in the public arena. 30 years of integrity. 30 years without the hint of scandal. 30 years with nothing but moral and institutional integrity. Al Mohler not only has known where he's going, he knows who he was. And finally, we look at our Lord, he knew why he was here. The disciples had rushed in. They were more interested in meat than men. They ran into town to get lunch. And they brought it back to our Lord. And he says to them in the text, in verse 31, when they bring him his lunch, he says, my meat, my food, the thing that sustains me is to do the will of him who sent me while there's yet time. He knew why he was here. To do the will of him who sent me, Jesus said. He not only knew where he was going and who he was, but why he was here. From the first day of Al Mohler's presidency to that day of that Q&A here, He's been moved and motivated and driven by purpose to do the will of him who sent him to this place. In the Corinthian letter, in the second Corinthian letter in the 10th chapter, Paul says in verse 13 that God has assigned to each of us an area of influence. Somewhere there's something for you to do that no one else can do like you can do. And every once in a while, there comes a person of destiny. And when they find that area of influence, and, and when the Greeks were reading that in that Corinthian letter, when they saw that, 
that, that, that translated phrase, they, they would have known exactly. It's a word they translate in those Grecian grains of the lane you run in in those relay races. God has assigned a lane to each one of us. And when we run in that lane, we affect others. We win a race. And we seek for the prize. And we thank God today for the gift that he's given us in Al Mohler, who not only has known where he was going, and who he was, but why he was here. Arguably the most famous graduate of this institution is my father in ministry, W.A. Criswell. I never come on this campus that I don't walk down to Mullins Hall and stand in the courtyard and sing a little chorus. Ninety Two years ago, he got in an old Chevrolet coupe and made a five-day journey from Waco to Louisville. And in his second year, he, he was so uninhibited. One morning, he got out in the courtyard in a crisp fall morning, cool morning, in the middle of the courtyard at, at uh, Mullins Hall and lifted his hands to God and started singing at the top of his voice, it pays to serve Jesus. Pays every day. Pays every step of the way. Little did he know, up on the third floor, there was a distraught and a discouraged student about to give up. Decades passed. Decades passed until Criswell had become a famed name among Western evangelicals. He was preaching in a great conference in Virginia. And after the conference, a long line of people came to want to shake his hand. And then there came a man with tears streaming down his cheeks, Paul Crandall, Crandall, who said, I had decided to leave the seminary. I had packed my suitcase and all my stuff was in it. It was closed. It was on my bed. I was putting on my overcoat to walk out the door to leave the seminary, to leave the ministry, distraught and discouraged. And I heard a noise from down in the courtyard. And he said, I went and opened the window and you were standing there singing at the top of your lungs. And he said, God spoke to my heart and I got down on my knees, unpacked my suitcase. And for the last 40 years have been pastoring Southern Baptist churches. Thank you, Al, for showing us it pays to serve Jesus. It pays every day. It pays every step of the way. And though the pathway to glory may some lime street drear, we'll be happy each step of the way. Let's learn a lesson from him. Know where you're going, who you are, why you're here. All three are important. You can know where you're going, but if you don't know who you are, you're not going to influence anyone. You can know why you're here, but if you don't know where you're going, it takes all three. Let's bow our hearts together in a prayer of thanksgiving for the gift that God has given us in our Albert Moeller. Father, seal these words today in our hearts. We thank you for this privilege today of honoring this couple, of ad ad taking the biblical admonition, Lord, that you said we were to do to honor those who labor among us and are over us in the Lord. And we esteem them highly in love today for their work's sake, for your glory is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.